you know, I think I speak for everyone listening and watching today, Monday, November 2nd, 2020, anniversary of the Cubs winning the 2016 World Series. I think I speak for everyone in that I'm glad this is a slow news week. There's nothing going on uh, in the world that you need to consume yourselves with. You can turn off your TV. You can stay offline, especially Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, pretty much everything, Snapchat. Just t- to keep tuck your phone away and focus on your mental health. It's the most important thing. There's nothing you need to really worry about. Put on a good podcast. I'd recommend this one that you're starting to listen to right now. So I don't really need to tell you to put on a good podcast. It's on right now, apparently. Continue listening to this podcast and tune out all the noise. First, and again, while you're not paying attention to the news, slow news week, nothing going on in the world. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. Focus on Il Taco Foods and the Pizza Puff, which you should have one this week while there's nothing going on. Il Taco Foods has been feeding the hungry people of Chicago since 1927. Their most popular item, the Pizza Puff, became a Chicago staple almost as soon as it hit the very first hot dog stand in the city. For those that don't know, a Pizza Puff is premium mozzarella, crumbled Italian sausage, and a signature homestyle sauce wrapped in a pillowy yet crispy crust. And that is just the original. They have 14 different flavors. I had a taco one this Sunday as I prepared for the slow news week. You can learn more about the flavors and where to buy them from their website, www.iltaco.com. Through four generations of hard work and a passion for good food, their family-run business now distributes Chicago's Pizza Puff in 38 states across the U.S. Check out the website to find out where you can get the good stuff. Again, that is www.iltaco.com. Today's guest um, and is somewhat topical. I'm not talking about the non-news going on in the world this week. Um, especially on on Tuesday, whatever is happening on Tuesday. Uh, Not really focused on that, but our guest today is Kimberly Kay. Kimberly is a senior contributing editor to LegalInsurrection.com. That is how it's spelled, if you can't spell insurrection. Um, I-N-S-U-R-R-E-C-T-I-O-N. She's a senior contributing editor at LegalInsurrection.com. And we talked today, broadly speaking, about campus culture and free speech on college campuses and academia in particular. Um, But, and I said this in the outset when when Kimberly and I were talking, campus culture is kind of a broad thing. Like everyone talks about, it almost comes cliche sometimes because it's talked about so much. Um, Some more narrowly focused, and legal instruction has done some work on this, focusing on college campuses, focusing on academics how this issue of not being open to free speech, not being open to opposing ideas got so bad in higher education. So we talked about that, but that opened up a larger discussion too about just how we create these divisions and how we we get to a place where we hate opposing ideas in general, which is something I think we're all familiar with and we all are sick of, especially right now, this week, as as things that I'm broadly speaking are going to be happening this week. Don't know. Don't listen to the news. Just turn it off. Don't pay attention to it. But in 2020, when everything seems divisive, but the majority of people really aren't that way. I mean, there's online versus real life. It's not the same. Um, so Kimberly and I get into the divisions um, and, and the the causes for why opposing views get so easily shut down and people can't actually just have a conversation about their disagreements and, and why free speech is becoming or has become i think it's kind of snapping back now and we talk about this as well uh just not something people are are excited about or want to invite as a principal especially in higher education so we start off talking about um some of the work that legal insurrection is doing with with um free speech and cancel culture on higher education but then uh you guys should stick around as we talk about things like facebook and twitter and how that contributes to the toxic political culture i feel like i gave away a lot of the podcast but it's really good just forget everything i said the long preview but jump into it right now this is me with senior contributing editor at legal insurrection kimberly k starting right now Ladies 
and gentlemen, Joe Kaiser. No, God, please, no, 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 no! I went out to eat for the sake of this next joke. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Pour the deviled cheese and sausage. Joe Kaiser, ladies and gentlemen. I usually think of when I think of the broad term of cancel culture, like how it affects people, like celebrities, people who um, have kind of a following, and then their people are told not to to follow them or not to give business to a business or something. Um, but how it relates to a campus is interesting. So, what, what was that event, and what? kind of message were you guys focused on about how that relates to a college campus? Yeah, so um, I write for Legal Insurrection, where I've actually been for six years, and I'm the senior contributing editing there, senior contributing editor there, and we also have uh, 501c3, so we have the Legal Insurrection Foundation, and this particular event was sponsored by the foundation, and so what we do is we research things in earnest. We cover things so, you know, especially with things like cancel culture on college campuses, that's something we track very closely. Uh, because as you mentioned, these things happen in a lot of different venues and broad culture. And it just so happens, so my boss, who happens to be the publisher of Legal Insurrection and is also the president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation, is a clinical law professor at Cornell. And he underwent a cancel attempt not too long ago. That was actually the summer. And so what we did, uh, I thought it would be a really good idea if we found other people who had undergone a similar, I guess, attack, if you would call it, <laughs> um, and, and have them talk about their experiences. And so through the course of discussion, we decided <clears throat> to limit the discussion specifically to college campuses. So that's kind of how that came about. And so we had two other professors who um, suffered, I guess, a similar fate. They both still have their jobs, as, as does my boss, but they went through an awful lot simply because of the views that they have, which of course is ironic because at least you know, if, if I can, I'm so old that when I was growing up, you know, colleges and universities were still supposed to be these vestiges of um, higher learning, or at least that was the ideal. And, you know, not, not just higher learning, but exchange of ideas. And it was a place where you would have professors who would challenge your ideas and challenge your thoughts, not to prove you wrong, not to make a point in terms of being right, but simply to engage you in the critical thinking process and to help you better fine tune what you think and what you believe. And then to also have evidence to back it up. I mean, that's the college system that I graduated from. If you, you could argue anything so long as your evidence supported it. If you don't have the evidence to back it up, well, good luck. You know, you better right, be right. incredibly persuasive. So, um, so yeah, so we, we put on this event, which was really, it, it went really, really well. And I think part of what's scary to many people right now is they watch, they watch this kind of stuff happening and you hear from so many people about how bad these people are that are being canceled, how toxic their ideas are, but you never actually hear from the people being canceled. <laughs> right. And so we really wanted to give a platform to that. Um, and, and yeah, so we had a really great discussion on what that looks like. There is kind of a pattern to being canceled. Uh, and just as my own little pitch, you can find the entire um, little event that we had. You can watch it online. But, um, but yeah, so we're also currently involved. There's a professor in Florida, and this case is just crazy, who issued two tweets, right? So usually what starts these things is something very innocuous. It's not like someone standing in front of a classroom, you know, dressed as Hitler or something like that. You know, it's not something wildly egregious that would attract a lot of attention. And he just questioned the idea of, um, of systemic racism 
and then also suggested a theory of black privilege and really all he was suggesting was it's like if you look at any other eth ethnic group like asian americans <laughs> would you still by looking at their success rate in so many different ways and by so many different metrics would you still consider that systemic racism and two tweets two tweets so rather than debate on the merits and that's one of the things that we find in common with every single one of these these cases is that there's never a debate on the ideas or on the merits it's always about attacking someone personally mm -hmm. and personally maligning them uh, never giving any airtime because I know at least in uh, the case of my boss, Professor William Jacobson, he wrote two blog posts on Black Lives Matter. And one of them was simply, it was just expository on the history of Black Lives Matter, right? So it's not even drawing conclusions. It's just, hey, this is this person, this is their bio, this is this person, this is their bio. And this is kind of when all of this started at the beginning of the summer. And they tried to have him fired because he wrote a post just explaining the history of, of this organization. And um, he even made the offer that he would be happy to debate people on, on this issue. You know, if, if someone wanted to disagree that he was more than happy to have that discussion if it, whether it was faculty or even a student group and a faculty in attendance, he would go one on however many to have a debate to actually discuss what they were most upset about. And I'm sure you'll be shocked to know there were no takers. Right. <laughs> you know? And so that's something we see over and over again. And in the case of um, this professor in Florida, uh, so he sends these tweets, which have since been deleted, but we do have them captured because the internet is forever and blog posts on the site. Um, there was a change.org petition that someone started that had over 30,000 signatures. People were protesting at his home, including the president of the university. I mean, it's just, it's things that are crazy. You can't make this stuff up. You can't dream this stuff up simply for challenging what I mean, I would argue is a very common talking point in broad culture and particularly in any culture or any cultural discussion that pertains to race. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that these things, by challenging the idea doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that you're challenging the idea. And, uh, you know, and for his crimes, I mean, he's he's been harassed for months. And so um, our foundation, the Legal Insurrection Foundation, has actually joined forces with Judicial Watch, and they're getting involved in that case uh, legally um, to help him out. And so it's just, it's something that we see all over the country. It's, it's really frightening because they're, I mean, I wouldn't call it a systemic purge, but there is it's ideologically consistent, right? You don't yeah. have left-wing professors who are being purged and nor are there calls to fire them for their ideas. Right. And, you know, like I said, at least in the world that I grew up in and I graduated to date myself a bit, I graduated from college in 2005. And I went to a very conservative university in Texas, went to Texas A&M University. And I had, um, very libertarian leaning professors. One of the best professors I had was the kind who would constantly challenge you. And this was, you know, on issues of American history. Um, but then when it came to uh, world history, there was a professor. And of course, after being in his class a couple of weeks, I'm going, this just seems weird. So one of the books we were reading was um, about the French Revolution. And it was written by a literal Marxist. And I mean, the book was, you know, probably close to 100 years old. And this was his perspective and what he was teaching. And these people coexisted at the same university and sure. they were friendly and had lunch together. And I mean, this is the way the world was, the way the world can be and the way the world should be. And that's just not the case anymore. Um, that it, It's weird. So I've, I've wondered this. So 2005 is not really that long ago. And even I was in college within the last decade, and I remember thinking just a few years after graduating, looking back at my university and other universities, seeing 
it seems like things shifted really quickly and all of a sudden there's questions about free speech on campuses that I'm sure didn't pop up out of nowhere, but it felt like they did as an outside observer. So obviously there's probably a slow burn to these, but what variables went into colleges going from a place where they encourage free debate, they encourage learning where you stand on things, learning how to think to all of a sudden being this, what you just described, this place of cancel culture, place where different views aren't welcome. It, It didn't happen overnight, but if you're not paying attention, it kind of feels like it did. I mean, I could, I, I guess I could suggest just purely off the top of my head, I have a couple theories as to why this happened so quickly. And this is, is a, a discussion that my husband and I have all the time, as you mentioned, just how quickly things have changed. You know, usually it takes a couple generations to lurch so far leftward or rightward or you know whatever the case may be and that just hasn't happened here i would argue that part of it is product of the public education system which as a parent is one of the only things that keeps me up at night is how to educate our kids (laughs) you know because um if this is the byproduct of the public education system i'm having none of it and i'm not going to put my kids in that these they're not learning anything, not anything that they should be learning. There's no basic understanding of civics. There's no basic understanding of who we are as a nation and what led to the founding of our nation. And instead, um, you know, it's turned into something where everything, everything about who we are as a people and who we are as a country and a nation is about the worst of what we've done. And I, I think that speaks more to a cultural problem. And it's part of why outside of all of the other factors that I cannot stand cancel cultures because it does not allow for any grace. It doesn't allow for any compassion. It seeks to take someone and paint them solely for the worst of who they are or their ideas. Um, if you know, if if that's what you believe about their ideas, rather than look at someone as a whole. And, you know, I'm not sure entirely how that came to be. I think some of it too is, you know, we also went pretty quickly, at least in our lifetime from having, for the most part, uh, one income household to two income households. And so that leaves the majority of education on the plate of public educators, which is too much. You know, I mean, you can Mm -hmm. say what you want about public education, but the role of a teacher has changed dramatically in my lifetime too. They're not just entrusted with teaching addition and subtraction. Now they have to look out for a kid's whole well-being and what might be going on at home that they don't know about because mom and dad are too busy working. And it's, you know, we're putting way too much on our teachers because it's not their job to raise our kids and teach them. They're just supposed to teach them what the book is, you know, is offering as instruction. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's multifaceted in that way. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely concerning. What I do know just in studying history, though, that anytime the pendulum swings one way, it will course correct. Yes, um, yeah. And so I think that's ultimately where we're headed, you know, whether electorally and of course, all of these things are far more enmeshed than I think they probably were in times past too, which is this idea that you will be made to care. And this really noxious notion too, that your political beliefs become part of who you are as a core person, which is just just so misguided and so unhealthy, you know, I mean, because as we grow, those things should and will change. You know, what I think and believe politically is not the same as what I thought and believed politically when I was 22 and before I got married and became a mom, because things do change when you're looking at the future for your kids and, and things like that. And, um, I just, I, I don't know. I, On the one hand, it's been really frightening to cover this kind of stuff with the judiciousness that we do cover. On the other hand, I am encouraged, though, 
because I do think that there are a handful of things that seem to be swinging in the other direction. So I think that course correction is rapidly approaching. I agree. I think <clears throat> it gets so bad that it's going to snap back kind of, and you almost hear <clears throat> just as many people talking about how bad it is on college campuses and how bad cancel culture is in general, that it feels like there are so many ridiculous cases of it that it's pushing people who otherwise might not have an opinion on these issues to care about how bad cancel culture is. I mean, not in a, it's not a, a higher education example, but I remember when Kevin Hart got fired from the Oscars because they found tweets that he made uh, gay jokes from 10, 10 years prior and all of a sudden he lost his job in the Oscars. People are like, why did you look up his tweets from 2010? It was just like the, the ridiculousness of that example forced people to be like, we should stop doing this. And the more and more ridiculous scenarios like that happen, I think it actually will convince more people that we should have more compassion, have pe see people as people. Because I think a big problem with it is, especially with celebrities, you just see them as a face and a name and it's easy to, to say whatever, you to... to, to forget that they're people and just mentally cancel them and, and, and treat them like crap online. Um, and a lot of that probably is also as cliche as it sounds with especially Twitter, but Twitter and Facebook and all social media, you're kind of stripping the nuance away from things. And then also trying to find your, like you just said, you, your politics shouldn't define you. It's kind of, it's horrible to be 18 or 19 and have your, your identity be like, I'm a progressive. I'm a cons like that's that sounds terrifying. You don't want to be tied. That's to that. awful. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think it is this of legalism. I think that's what we're seeing is this. Ultimately, I think if if you boil it down, that's that's what you're left with. It is a it's legalism, and no one can ever be pure enough, good enough, woke enough, whatever enough to meet these these tests, right? Everyone will have had a wrong thought, <laughs> if you want yes. to call it that. At, at some point, at some time, and if you have, you know, met the unfortunate um, fate of being a human and living in your own humanity at some point in time, you too are fair game for for cancel culture. And so I think at some point, you know, the the movement eats itself. I mean, if you can call it, I mean, it's not a movement, but it is a cultural idea. The movement eats itself. And so I think what, what counters legalism is just grace and compassion. You know, it's saying, well, hey, you know, <laughs> I really disagree with this. And I think you're crazy for questioning systemic racism or insert whatever buzzword. Um, and I would argue unfounded buzzword or term, you know, these things are put together and it's like what, what does this even mean you know yeah. um and I think it was Thomas Sowell too who um who discussed how it's impossible to prove systemic racism and not that I want to have a debate about that right in this moment but that that's part of this too is is words and what they mean and part of cancel culture seeks to redefine the language that we use which is really frightening because as someone who writes for a living um, and even with our kids, I'm going, okay, but the words we use matter. And it's really important that we do the best we can to find the words that best match what we're trying to say. Um, otherwise, we have a massive communication breakdown. <laughs> and that, that's not what, what we want. That's not helpful to anyone. It's just, ultimately, this kind of purge, is, it's just not helpful. And I think as the pendulum swings, as I, as I see it doing, it's going to, it would be very easy for those who have been on the canceled side of this, who've had their lives upended and have been tormented um, simply for covering, in many cases, facts like my boss. You know, like there was nothing that was suggestive in anything he wrote. He's just saying, hey, this is this person, this is what they believe, this is well documented. Um, and they tried to destroy him and his livelihood and his years long career. Uh, I think it would be easy to want to take vengeance on people when the pendulum does swing. And I think that's where we have to be very cautious to be gracious and compassionate and remember that no one 
is above these things you know right it's possible that at any point in time through any venue because the left and right both cancel we see it more from the left but they both cancel and um it's one of my just to kind of tangent here it's it's one of my huge pet peeves you know Saul Alinsky and rules for radicals and you know that's those kinds of things are quoted and and used I think too much in politics and the left does these things so then the right says well but you have to make them play by their own book book of rules and um I just don't find that helpful because Alinsky was divisive ultimately that's what he was going after he was looking for the wedge he was looking for ways to exploit the wedge and then to leverage that to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish politically in any community and i don't think we should engage in that like just i don't think it's helpful i don't care what where you stand politically it's just not helpful there's no way you can build consensus or coalition or come up with anything that actually helps people <laughs> live better lives and um, accomplish what they're able to accomplish if we're always looking to destroy one another by some way. Uh, definitely, yeah. Um, and I think the, the, the left and the right both cancel, but the reason you do see them more on the left probably has a lot to do with the fact that the left is the predominant like th- that is higher ed that is entertainment like if if the right was the monolith for these different institutions you might see it the other way if somebody stepped out the fact that most people in hollywood most people in higher ed most people in these different areas are are liberal progressive that means if somebody does step out from their way of thinking then that's when they they go get them but you do see this kind of instinct I mean, it's kind of anecdotal but you see it online sometimes when it's kind of the other way when people on the right are like, we should boycott this. We should stop following this. Like it's almost a human instinct because the rules that have been set up is they feel that and they want to get back at them. And that I'm glad you said that because that seems like a really dangerous way of thinking where now all of a sudden we're all canceling each other. And instead of getting compassion, now we're even growing farther apart because the response is to do the exact same thing. And that'll create even greater divide and, and even less compassion if that's the way people go. Well, and that's exactly the opposite of how we teach our kids, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. If someone hits you, you don't say, yeah, hit him back, hit him harder, you know. I hope not. <laughs> Kick him in the groin, but that's just not what we do. You know, we tell them that we need to take a step back, everyone needs to chill out, and then we need to figure out what's actually going on there, and we need to de-escalate, and that's just currently not the compulsion culturally it's to like take things to 11 you know (laughs) and and every opportunity and so you know I do there's a lot to be said even about the president and rhetoric and all of that and you know chicken and egg what created what do we have this because of um regardless of what you think of him you know the way he talks and all of that Uh, do we have that as a byproduct of culture or is he representative of culture or you know but I think it's always important to remember that we're always dealing, everyone is dealing with something. And I know that sounds so trite, but it's so true. You know, we're all just trying to do the best that we can and to enjoy what bit of life that we can and um, to enjoy the relationships we have. And ultimately, I think that's how a lot of this does get corrected is that the shift moves from looking at people as an object into looking at the relationships we can have with people and it's perfectly possible you know I one of my best friends she and I have been best friends since our first job out of college working in immigration law and we're diametrically opposed politically and guess what (laughs) we're still best friends so I think it's about being able to actually do the things that a lot of progressives teach which is to appreciate the differences and the fact that we do have different thoughts and we do have different ways that's so fun you know it's Mm -hmm. it's part of what creates the diversity and variety that keeps us going every day and it pulls us out of the monotony and so you know I I do tend to be a little bit overly optimistic idealistic so I can kind of get a little bit 
you know, kumbaya, can't we all get along? <laughs> and, I, and I know that, you know, we're probably not headed into something like that, but I do think um, like this is just, the current course is not sustainable. And um, like I said, if I do have any message or anything that I really wish I could impress, it's just that when things do change, that we we reach out a hand, because there's a lot of people who are gonna need a lot of hugs. <laughs> I mean, if you're yes. that angry that you feel like you have to destroy someone's life because they think something that you don't wanna hear, you really need a hug, a good hug, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that's kind of my my little message no i i mean i i agree with the positivity of it all i i just wonder about like the steps to get there because i don't mean to sound like a like a old uh crotchy old man here but i think a, a big issue is people finding their identity and their online profile just because that boils things down to like a really simple um representation and then you don't have conversations with people where you get to know them and get to know how they think and feel is easier because everyone's just their online identity. I sound like I'm like 60 years old here, but um, I mean, it wasn't just Twitter and Facebook, like MySpace was around in the early 2000s. And I think this is all stuff that just encourages people to be kind of a simplified version of what they want to create online. Um, and I don't know if you, if you just tell people, like it would help everyone's mental health if they stop scrolling through Twitter, but can you just tell people to stop stop being online so much because the, the online is not the real world. The way people talk to each other on Twitter is not how people interact. If we were just all out in the open and having real conversations, I don't know, but I feel like that's a huge part of it is just to get away from that world and actually talk to people, get to know them, get to know people who are different from you. Cause it's boring if you're just by people who think alike. Yeah. You never get to grow. I mean, th there's no opportunity to grow in your ideas and in what you think if you constantly surround yourself with yes people you know, which is something I, I never wanted. I want people to challenge me so that we can hash it out because you're going to be wrong sometimes. And it's not even about being right or wrong. It's just the opportunity to grow and develop as a person, as a whole person, like you said, not just as a picture of a person that you want people to think you are by what you cherry pick to put online. I think it's really interesting that you bring that up because uh, with all of the censorship that we've seen and suppression of stories and claims that things aren't verified when they readily push things that are also unverified. Um, and I think the best example of that is this Hunter Biden story that, that the major social network platforms have purposely suppressed. And their claim was that, that the claims were unverified but we also know that with the Trump Russia stuff, all of that was unverified and we heard nothing but that for years and there was no suppression on these platforms. I think it's really interesting because I know that they're being hauled before uh, Senate committees this week and I'm curious to see how that changes. But I do think going into, if we do have a second Trump term, I, I think we'll see some major changes in social media because for a very long time they have operated under the guise of being a platform and they're not. I don't think there's any way to justify that they are only a platform and that they're no longer engaging in publishing because they edit constantly. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is not a very simple, you know, user terms of service where if you drop an F bomb, they're going to, you know, knock you out of your account or something um this is they are determining what information is right information and what information is wrong information and that's very much like the job that i do day in day out as an editor so um and i know that there are a couple senators who have have really picked up on that namely senators cruz and howley and I understand the free market argument, but I think we have, and, and that argument being that you have to let these things course correct on their own, let the free market decide. But I also think it's, we have to be able to recognize what they are now. And it's not that they're just a platform that anyone can deactivate from. They are pushing and editing information. This is how a lot of people consume news and even with Google and search analytics. Uh, I guess it shouldn't be a surprise, but this was 
sometime earlier this year, I was looking for a very particular quote from um, George W. Bush for something I was writing. And, you know, I go into Google and search, and, I, and of course, I can't remember what it is right off the top of my head. Um, and it was, I, I couldn't find, I mean, I think I found it on page 10. And at the time, it was something that was everywhere, you know, so it's not mm -hmm. like I'm looking for something really obscure, but instead, every single search result that comes up is about how he, it was all negative about George W. Um, and so, and again, like you said, I don't want to be one of those people that is crying wolf about search engine optimization and, and the way that they're, um, they're sifting and sorting these things for the user experience, but there's definitely something really screwed up with all of this, you know, yeah. and, and the way that they're choosing to give us the information that they want us to have as opposed to the information that is available. And, and that's a problem. And I think that that reckoning is on the horizon. Uh, so I'm hoping that in doing so that might correct some of this, at least from an information standpoint, which I would hope would trickle down a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I know at least for me, I removed all social media from my phone. Um, yeah, because I mean, when you do this day in, day out, if I didn't have to have social media for work, like there's, um, I wouldn't have it at all as much as I enjoy being able to keep tabs with my friends from all over. But I mean, I'm sure you've seen this time and time again, you see someone who's fronting something on social media and this perfect life and perfect this and perfect that and perfect this. And then the next thing you know, they've had a complete and total breakdown because they've vanished off the face of the planet and no one knows who they are, or where they are. And I think it puts an additional pressure that you have to be someone that you're not. And I think ultimately that's what all of this is to kind of bring it full circle. Castles. You know, that's, it's all about trying to fit in with a very particular idea of what you think you should be and what you think your thoughts and politics and all of these things should be instead of just being you. And yes. I think we have so many people who are so lost. Um, and that's why they're looking for their identity in politics and in <clears throat> political ideologies. And there's a fantastic book that I read right around the time that I got involved in politics that I think speaks perfectly to this. Tom Wolfe, who's one of the best writers ever, ever, ever. Um, he had, there are two short stories, is Radical Chic and Mao Maoing the Flat Catchers. And he, he wrote this in the 60s and it speaks exactly to this, right? That you could have people who were dead wrong, you know, in posh society and the they're all, the way he stages it, you know, it's everyone is at this, this cocktail party. No one is comfortable by the fact that they brought in some Black Panthers to talk about, you know, what they're doing and why. No one in the room is comfortable and no one is dare going to say that they're not comfortable or walk away because it's just been accepted that this is culturally appropriate. And if you want to be part of this clique, and if you want to be in the in crowd, which I know makes me sound like such a mom, but you, if, if you want to be part of that, then you, you have to agree. This is part of the terms of service. You have to agree to this, or at least to agree not to say anything <laughs> or to question anything. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing here. And I think that's run its course too, because I think on every count, Every entity that plays into this, whether it's Hollywood or social media or the political wokeness, for lack of a better summation of it, uh, the media, everyone has overplayed their hands. And as you mentioned, they put people in a place where they're being forced to decide and they're not going to choose that because... Mm -hmm we are as a people very stubborn <laughs> and we don't like being put in a place where we have to make these choices and you know to make a choice which is a false choice it's like you either agree with this and you're right or you agree with it and you're a racist and you're immoral and you hate all minorities and children and puppies and you know it's just people are tired of it and people see through that and I think that's ultimately what's going to cause the turnaround. I totally agree. I love that optimism because I really do think most people 
would agree that they're not interested in all that. And I, I had a friend yesterday who um, texted me something. I forgot, I forgot what the tweet was, but it was something related to the election. And he's like, man, I, I really need to get off this, this website because it's making me so depressed. And I was like, then get off. This isn't, this isn't real life. Like, you think a lot of people are having these takes about stuff. Like, I think most people are, are just what you said. If they have to decide on these things, they're going to be part of the turnaround on all of this. I would encourage anyone. Um, I deleted Facebook and Snapchat off my phone maybe two years ago. And I immediately realized within like three weeks that I didn't need either of those things. When you like don't I, realize how much time, how much just becomes a habit. I think yeah. so the first time my daughter um, asked me if I would put my phone down so I could watch her do something. I'm going, okay. Now, I, and I mean, I do have to be on my phone because I have to be available for work and stuff and our kids are small still, but I'm going, so this is a problem. So I deleted everything. I didn't realize how much of a habit it had become. And you just, you don't need it. And I think through the course of all of that, that kind of started this whole simplification of everything. We don't need these things. You know, mm -hmm. like I, we don't need the social media. We can pick up the phone and call our friends. Um, or better yet, invite them over for dinner. We don't need to have 20,000 toys. You know, they have, we're very particular and ensuring that they don't get a ton and they're perfectly happy, you know. Um, you just don't need these things. And, and like you, if I could encourage anyone, don't choose things that are going to make you sad and make you feel gross. <laughs> I mean, it is a choice. Turn off the news. And, and like you said, I mean, I've worked in politics for almost 10 years, and it's something that I've said from the beginning. This is not in any way representative of the rest of the world. This is not representative of the electorate. It's not representative of the way real people think. And you don't have to have an opinion on everything. You don't. No. And if you do, <laughs> please don't. No one, no one cares. <laughs> no one cares. That's part of it is this is also sown this self-righteous kind of self-importance that just doesn't exist. Like no yeah. one cares, you know. And and I don't mean to say that in a nihilistic way. Yes, people love you and care about you and things like that. But um, the world is going to be okay if you don't share your take on whether or not we should be like eating Chick-fil-A, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's not necessary for the course of life. And, uh, but I, I feel that across the board though, you know, a lot of the changes I know that we've made in our family and cutting out social media time and all of those things to the extent possible with, with work and really just kind of simplifying and trying to enjoy actual life. I think a lot of people are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that the platforms are feeling it too. The social media platforms are feeling that because their their usership continues to decline. So I, I am encouraged, but you know, the news, don't, don't listen to the news. Don't watch the news all day, every day, or even every day. It's so fast. It's like fast fashion where, you know, it's disposable, you know, <laughs> things move so quickly that if you miss it for a couple days, you can pick right back up. You know, mm -hmm. and, and a quick search, you're going to be able to figure out like probably the one or two things that might be worth knowing. And if you don't catch every story, it's fine. I don't, you know, <laughs> I do this for a living and I don't. Uh, people ask me all the time, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? I'm going, no, I didn't because I was focused on, you know, this very particular thing. And guess what? It's okay. Like, it's yeah. just, it is the better way. I have done both and it is the better way absolutely you see i mean it, this isn't new but you see more and more people saying like i don't know like cable news is poison like i can't watch it and then now i know plenty of people that are like i think i need to deactivate my facebook or my twitter account um so i think really so this is the interesting free market response whether or not there are like legal changes to twitter is social media apps have changed in the last 20 years and cable news has changed in the last 20 years is how we consume information has changed. There's no, there's nothing saying that Twitter and Facebook are going to be around forever um, or going to be the main ones forever. So I think if we as a people, if the market says that we want something that's less, that has more nuance or that is less um, combative, then maybe the next thing, even if it, if we are still stuck online, the next way we use it is more compassionate and it is more 
nuance and it's more about bringing people together. I don't know what that looks like. Maybe I'm being too optimistic and too kumbaya like right now. I like it. I don't know. I, that's the interesting free market response that I think is if people hate how they're getting information right now and they feel like everything's toxic and they, they hate cancel culture and they hate the way we talk to each other, is there a way to change that to make it so it's the opposite? I don't know. I, th- I mean, and I think, I think you hit it on the head, which is just I mean, deactivate and act, talk to people in real life. And I think, you know, as that happens, as more people make those choices, then um, they become more and more of an echo chamber. And it becomes obvious that it's less and less representative of what's happening in real life. Because I know a ton of people who um, are very active in all kinds of things, whether politically or otherwise, and they're, uh, they're never online. You know, they Mm -hmm. don't even have an account. They're very well informed. They have better thought out ideas and perspectives than pretty much anyone you hear on the news. And just um, like as a cable news hack, every show tells you the exact same thing over and over again. If you watch one for the day, you've watched like 24 hours worth of network programming, you know, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to be informed, but long, long time ago when I first started all of this, I decided I couldn't listen necessarily. Listening doesn't bother me as much, provided it wasn't one of the people yelling at me. But I certainly wasn't going to watch cable news. I wanted to read it because I don't need someone telling me what I think about things. I don't need someone, you know, gingerly connecting every little dot for me. So I've always watched stuff on C-SPAN because there's no commentary, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I can watch a hearing, I can watch a whatever, um, and I can use my own brain, which is what it's there for. And it's a lot more fun to to do that even without the influence of Twitter or Facebook or anything as these things are happening because you're actually giving yourself the opportunity to watch something and and see something and figure out what it is you think about it before instantly being swayed by what someone else. And it's so subtle and we all do it though. Because you might, you know, especially if you've ever live tweeted something or if you've been looking at a Twitter feed while a speech or debate or whatever is happening simultaneously, a lot of people have a lot of really pithy, quick things to say, but I just... I, I figured a long time ago that I, I didn't think that was helpful for me. And so mm-hmm. I cut it off and it's made a huge difference. Yeah. Something like C-SPAN would challenge you to want to learn more if you can't make up your mind or to think about how you feel about something. Whereas if you watch Tucker Carlson followed by Sean Hannity, followed by Laura Ingram, you've watched the same show three times in a row packaged yes. slightly differently. Exactly. Um, that's great. Uh, is, there, is there anything else that you guys are working on at Legal Insurrection, maybe even related to college campuses or um, something you're working on that you want to um, promote that you want to talk about um, before I let you go? Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually, I'm really glad you asked. We're working on a project that I'm super excited about. Um, <clears throat> one of our researchers has spent a ton of time digging into anti-racism, which the name itself is just ludicrous, but anti-racism programming on college campuses. And so we're working to take the research that he's done and to put it into a clickable, usable map. It won't be comprehensive for every single college and university, but we'll cover close to 100. So you'll be able to go to a map, um, click on, let's just say, I don't know, Indiana, and click on a school in Indiana and will tell you whether or not they're engaging in this anti-racism. And anti-racism is social justice stuff on steroids. It's the kind of, it's all based in critical race theory, which is that, which is racism. It's that if you are not a person of color, you are racist, which is just, as I said, it's ludicrous. Um, and so that's something that they've really, uh, really kicked up on a lot of campuses. And so we're working on that. We should have that released in a couple of weeks. Um, so I'm really excited that we have a ton of research and that we get to put it into a format that's actually going to be helpful. Um, and it's something we'll maintain and I think it'll be really great. 
the, so, the, the idea of like anti-racism, some kind of anti-racism programming is insane to me because one, I think most people engage in anti-racism every day. We're just not racist. And then two, does that mean the opposite is race is these schools are racist if they don't have an anti race <laughs> like I, I, I mean everything about it i think this to me this is peak social justice i mean yeah where do you go from here and how do you get yourself out of that corner um but it's still something they're doing and it's something that's being taught and i think it's really important one of the questions that we get a lot kind of in that same vein from parents um from readers is you know how do they ensure that their kids or how do they deal with this and help their kids navigate this really nasty kind of culture on campus? And I mean, our recommendation is always look at where your money's going because I think a lot of times it's the metrics that we used when we were selecting a college are very different from what should be used now. But we also weren't in a cultural battle, you know, of the 11th hour like, like we are now. Um, it's, I mean, great if it has a, a great campus online, your campus life and pretty parks and all that kind of stuff. That's wonderful. But you need to know the social attitude of the campus uh, because it's where you're going to send your babies. It, they're going to play a key role in some very formative years. And it's, it's really good to be informed so you can make the decision that works best for, for you and your family and, and your kiddos. So we're hoping that this will be a tool that can be used in helping to make some of those decisions too. Yeah, and also maybe over time, with based off the the work that you guys are doing, influence the way that that universities shape their their culture. And, they may, yeah. and like, if enough people are choosing to go to different schools, or if enough light is shined on on these things, maybe over time, then they'll they'll change their ways too. Because I realize nobody really wants this kind of stuff. I don't think so. I think it's all been, you know, like we discussed, kind of a product of peer pressure more than a genuine wholesale belief that yeah. this is the way. And so, I mean, I think it's the more people that stand up and say, it's really not, why don't you come over here? The easier it gets for people to step out of it. But, you know, we're also in a, in a climate where people are terrified that they're going to lose their livelihoods, they're going to lose their homes, you know, and how do you provide for your family if you just stand up and say actually i don't agree you know and that's that's literally all it takes and it can cost you everything but again i'm heartened i just everything i see and everything i feel says that i think all of this is coming to an end and so it'll just be even more important for us to be there for people who've been not wronged but you know kind of bamboozled by all of this you know absolutely love the optimism uh, where can people find you or find Legal Insurrection online? Yeah, so legalinsurrection.com. That is a blog, and we publish multiple times daily. Um, and then the Legal Insurrection Foundation is just that, legalinsurrectionfoundation.org. That said, you can find anything that we're doing on the foundation on the blog as well. And my name is Kimberly K, and I'm just at Kimberly K on Twitter. I'm spelled really weird. <laughs> um, K-E-M-B-E-R-L-E-E-K-A-Y-E. -E -E -E. So um, not on near as much as I used to be, but I do pop That's in good. periodically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to check and say hi to people. So Awesome. Thank you so much, Kimberly. This has been great. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And thanks for having me on. Yeah.